Hello and welcome to another Tyco video. Today I am going to be demonstrating how to create a light curve using the Tyco software. Now I have done a similar video in the past. This time however I will be using the most up-to-date version of Tyco and to show that this works well even on low-end computers I have here a 2014 MacBook Air equipped with a dual-core CPU and only 8 gigabytes of system memory. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. Okay, so first I am going to launch the Tyco software and this will present with the image manager. So first I want to go ahead and add images. So I'm going to add the first night of data for this light curve. And as you can see, there are 123 images and they have not yet been plate solved. So I'm going to go to action view images just to see what we are dealing with here. And this will inform us to whether or not uh, we have good images to work with, uh, as well as whether or not they have yet been aligned. So if I want to do that, I can go to animate and choose an animation interval. So I'll choose 100 milliseconds. And just based on that, it's pretty easy to see uh, that these uh, images have not yet been uh, aligned. You can see uh, all the movements here. Uh, so what that means is that we want to go ahead and uh, first align the images. So I'm going to go to action, align images. And uh, if you're not sure what all these parameters are, uh, the user guide has more detail on each parameter, but I'm just going to use the default settings for now. So I click on OK. So this will proceed to uh, load the images and then start to align them here, as you can see. Uh, if I recall correctly, the last image uh, had clouds uh, presented, and so it may not align that last image, but uh, this should still wind up being around 120 images uh, when it has finished. And I will also point out that this particular data set is also available from the Tyco website. So if you wanted to try it out, feel free to do so. So let's just go ahead and give it a moment here to finish the alignment. Uh, the other thing I'll point out while it's doing that is that I have my observatory set to K80. That is the MPC code associated with the uh, observatory that acquired these images. So I could go to settings observatory and you can see here uh, that that is what I have made as the active uh, observatory. Again, the user guide has more detail on that. All right, so the images have now been aligned. Uh, they are not yet plate solved, so let's go ahead and do that. So I go to action, plate solve images. And again, I'm just going to use the default parameters. Uh, once again, user guide will have more uh, detail on that, but just to keep this a short video, uh, I'm just going to go over the high level uh, functions that I'm carrying out here. So now that we've aligned and plate solved the images, uh, now what I'd like to do is, uh, there's a couple ways you can create photometry to construct a light curve. You can, in this case, since this is a known object, I could attach ephemeris information to the data set. And I find that to be particularly helpful because uh, that way I don't have to specify marker one and two, which that's not really all that difficult, but uh, this is just a nice, uh, uh, easy way to do it. So go to ephemeris, attach from JPL Horizons, and I happen to know both the number as well as the name of the object. So this is asteroid Ivar, and it has number 1627. So if you want to do the name, you could choose asteroid or comet name, but here I'm just going to choose asteroid or comet number. So that works easy enough, and then choose attach to data set. So now that I've done that, you can see here that these columns have been populated. So all of these ephemeris columns have been populated. So we have the magnitude of the object, the speed and position angle, altitude, and so forth. And the last column here indicates whether or not the object is expected to be within the field of view for each image. So uh, you always want to make sure that it has computed the value to be yes. So uh, that's a good sanity check. At this point, we can go back to action view images. So again, they have been aligned and plate solved. And if we want to, we can confirm that by going to animate once more. And we should see that here, uh, it looks like the uh, object is now being tracked uh, quite well. And indeed, the, the images have been aligned. So uh, that looks pretty good to me. So because we've done that, uh, we can now go ahead and proceed with uh, setting up the parameters for the photometry. So one thing of importance is the uh, the aperture uh, setting. So if I go to photometry, modify aperture settings, I can choose the desired uh, radius uh, for the uh, aperture here. So uh, if I want to, it's useful to have the contrast set to 
uh, zero. So that way you know uh, kind of where that uh, the signal starts to taper off for sure. And uh, that here I might increase it just a little bit uh, to um, a radius of six thereabouts. Um, you, you want to have most of the uh, object signal tightly enclosed uh, around the, that uh, inner app so around that inner aperture radius and if I want to I can just look at a few more images here and see that it is uh, enclosed in that inner radius so I may give it just a slight amount uh, there we go so uh, that looks to be pretty good to me uh, so now that I have specified the aperture settings I can proceed to generate a list of comparison stars so I can go to photometry find comp stars and this is a convenience function it allows me to easily see uh, which comparison stars uh, meet a given filter so I can specify a filter on magnitude on uh, the uh, color uh, so for example B minus V min and max so if we want solar uh, color temperature stars then we can have that sort of filter enabled and then also this trend line on the right here is also useful uh, to indicate that we have a nice fit of the, of the data here so uh, what I like to do is simply put I will right click and choose add to active comp stars uh, for each one of these and again this is just building up a list of comparison stars for the differential photometry now I could have been lazy and said well I can just use automatic comp stars and if I do that uh, then the program will automatically choose comp stars but uh, I recommend against that just because you're not going to be guaranteed a good uh, optimal result uh, with automatic comp stars. So it's highly recommended to do this uh, manual uh, comp star selection. So as we have our list here, we can make sure that uh, we have a good list of comp stars. So if we find one that we don't like, we can uh, right click on it and choose remove and then go back to uh, generate data. Now I am actually viewing this data using uh, this computed mag versus time uh, that that is the setting I have here uh, if you had it in raw magnitude versus time you might see uh, this sort of profile here on the right uh, so you don't want that you want to have the uh, computed magnitude versus time so in any case they should present as a nice uh, horizontal uh, uh, trend here and so uh, these look to be an optimal set of uh, comparison stars. If you wanted to, you could also save your list here. You could export uh, to a text file. But uh, for now, just to keep this a short uh, tutorial, uh, I have at this point uh, aligned plate solved. I've attached uh, ephemeris information. I have uh, supplied the desired aperture settings and I have constructed a list of comparison stars. So now I can proceed to generate the data points for the light curve of, of this first night of data. So I can right click here in the image viewer and choose create photometry ephemeris. Now, before I continue, I did want to take just a moment to share the other approach. Uh, in other words, rather than attaching ephemeris information to the data set, uh, one would make use of the marker approach. Now, why would you want to do that? Well, for example, uh, you, maybe you want to create a light curve of a variable star or an exoplanet uh, for which there is no entry uh, in the JPL Horizons database. So the marker approach is actually pretty straightforward. All you have to do is navigate to a starting image in the data set. This would typically be uh, the first image, but it does not have to be. So I choose some image here, and then I double click on the object and choose create marker one. And then I navigate to a later image in the data set. Uh, again, that would typically be the last image, but it, it does not have to be. So I can double click on the object once more and choose create marker number two. So now I have defined two markers that uh, specify the motion of the object. Now, in the case of a stationary object, uh, then markers one and two would simply be at the same position. So it, it's very straightforward, uh, but I did want to include that in the tutorial just in case there was some uh, question about how you would go about creating a light curve of other types of objects. And so the marker approach is how you would do it. So you would choose, in that case, uh, create photometry from markers. But in this example, I have attached ephemeris information, so I can proceed to choose create photometry from ephemeris. So once I've done that, then uh, we now have one set of photometry data. And so I can go to graph, plot all sets, there's only one. But uh, here's what that looks like. 
So we have this nice uh, light curve being shown here. And if we wanted to, we could try to uh, determine its rotation period uh, from 0 0.5 to 12 hours. And we're, com we're uh, provided with a list here. Uh, the first result here is not quite. Uh, that's, that's just one peak, one valley. So this is not a bimodal curve. Uh, but if we go to the next return candidate, this is a bimodal uh, result here, having two peaks and two valleys. So that's much more likely to be the rotation period of this asteroid. And you can see here it says 4.737 hours. And if we wanted to compare that with the published value, we could go to Tools, uh, Light Curve Database, and I could search for uh, this object. And you can see here uh, the published value is 4.795. So 4.737 is pretty close, but again, that's where you would have more than one night of data uh, to get you an, a more accurate uh, result. So if I wanted to, I could do File, uh, Import, uh, from a uh, repository, and I happen to have nights two and three also uh, uh, computed here. So if I go to graph plot all sets, then this is what that looks like. Uh, if you do have a, an erroneous, if you will, data point, you can always drag a rectangle around it and then right click and choose delete. So that's how you can do that. Uh, you can also configure the graph settings. You can choose what, uh, uh, maybe if you want to have horizontal lines here, you can do things like that. So uh, lots of ways to customize the graph. But uh, also I recommend, of course, if you are working with more than one night of data to apply what's called object data. So I select the photometry sets here, right click and then choose apply object data. And here uh, I can specify once again, uh, either the object number or name. And so here again, this is 1627. And we do a search and then we can click on the result here and choose OK. Now, if this were a new object that did not have a published uh, orbit, then you could actually choose apply from observation. So if you had a very new object that uh, people have submitted measurements for, but it's not been designated and does not have a, a published orbit, you could uh, uh, use that approach as well. But this is a known object, so we can do this here. Click OK. And you want to give it a moment. It may take a moment or two. And once it has finished, then as before, you can scroll through uh, horizontally and you should see these columns uh, be updated with this uh, information. So now that we have applied object data, I can go to graph, plot all sets, and you'll notice that uh, it has, for example, light time correction will be checked by default as well as H minus G correction. So it may not seem like it made much of a different difference uh, for this uh, set of data here, but there are other uh, objects and uh, photometry sets for which you'll notice a more uh, 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 meaningful difference. So just keep that in mind. Again, user guide has more detail. I'm going through this pretty quickly just to keep this a short video. But now that we do have three nights of uh, data, then we can try to find the period once more. So I'll do find period and hopefully we'll get something closer to that four point. Uh, 795. And so here is the returned result, and it looks like that's pretty good. This is 4.7953. So as you can see, with multiple nights of data, we now have a rotation period that is very much in agreement with the published value. That's about it for this video. I want to thank you for watching, and see you next time.